Uh, so welcome to the Woodridge Public Library this afternoon. I'm Patty Nesbitt with Programs, and I'm always open to suggestion. As you may have guessed, I have been enjoying our guests' uh, sense of humor as we've planned the program. Uh, Clarence Goodman is a Renaissance man, as far as I uh, can tell from his accomplishments. Not only is he a private tour guide in Chicago, if you were to be so lucky, he is a musician playing both his original works and uh, classics. And he is a historian and a lecturer, and I think you're going to have a delightful time. Uh, we're offering this program in celebration of Black History Month. I'm very proud of the programming we've offered over the last few years, and we've had a uh, nice presence in all of our uh, Black History Month programs. Uh, this month, you may have noticed we spread things out across the month. We have a lovely art exhibit downstairs in the lobby that you'll want to stop and see. Uh, one of our local Woodridge residents has some portraitures of famous African Americans that she's done with thread. It's amazing. Uh, and we had another resident give a, a look at Liberia. Some of you attended that a couple of weeks ago. So thank you for coming, and thank you, Mr. Goodman, for coming. <laughs> and please, let's uh, come with the show. Yeah, sure. Thank you. You know, I'm going to be 58 in a couple of months, and I, I have still not gotten used to Mr. Goodman. It's just so weird. Uh, I want you to give it up for Patty, who is great and a charming and learned individual. And, and, and you might see a lady that's trying to hide from you behind her camera. Her name is Brittany, and like you, she's here not only of her own volition, but nobody's paying her to uh, be here. And she's here working for the village, your home here. So thank you very much for coming. Clarence Goodman here. I hope you have a good time. I hope you have a few laughs. If you like bad jokes, you're going to have a good time uh, this afternoon for the next uh, 60 minutes or so. Emancipation to the inauguration. The tapestry that I call the Chicago quilt, many different fibers, many different colors of fabric have been used in this quilt that we refer to as Chicago, the home that we love so much. So without any further ado, are you ready? Yeah. That was underwhelming. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Much better. Yes. So this quilt, click. Ah, the most important bit of information I can give you. I'm a wise guy, so if you don't want me to incorporate you and your ringtone into this presentation, silence, deaden, mute, put your phone to sleep for just a few minutes. Oh boy, everybody reached for it right there, my golly. All right, here we go. So. The story of the African-American experience in Chicago, Chicago's black experience goes back to the very beginning when Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet first arrived in this area called Chicago, the legend of Chicago in this great looking place for a community. It spread through the French speaking tongues and residents here in North America and got all the way, suckly blue, to the ears of this guy who was living near Cincinnati at the time. This guy needs no introduction, but why don't you guys all introduce him? <laughs> okay, not everybody all at once. Jean Baptiste Pointe Sable. And believe me, there's no such thing as a wrong answer. If I call on you and you say the wrong answer, I will be so sweet and tell you that it was the wrong answer. Yes, Jean Baptiste Pointe Sable, he is, oh, Chicago. Eh? And he comes this way and he arrives and he's the first non indigenous person to come to this area. And as the Native Americans were wont to say, the first white man in Chicago was actually a black man. And so so, all of these other, that, that was a joke they made, that's not one of my jokes. You would have laughed slightly less had it been one of my jokes. Um, so, all of these French speaking people start to arrive here, and of course, many of them are white. Many of them are black. Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable arrived in roughly 1790. And so, with the arrival of people of different colors, the black people get controlled. How many of you, by sign of hands here, showing you, me your hands, have heard of black codes in America? Yeah, if there's a community and one black person sets foot in your community, traditionally, a, a book of laws about this thick had to be orchestrated to keep black 
people down and in control. This in spite of the fact that Chicago, when it was incorporated as a town in 1833, had only 400 people. And roughly a handful of them were black people. So, got to keep people down with the black codes. And, and sadly, if you go to nearly any city in the United States that predates 1950, you will find buried somewhere black codes. And since race is always an issue in this land that we love, race is always an issue here in this city that we live. And race really reared its head to tragic uh, circumstances in the 19th century. A brand new political party born in the 1850s, not far from here, the Republican Party, and they were predicated upon what? Ending slavery. This was the thing about the Republican Party, and they did pretty good. They went from a brand new party, 1850s, to their first attended Republican convention in Chicago in 1860. You've heard of this guy. You've seen this guy. Yeah, this is Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, it's Henry Fonda, actually. Um, yeah, Abraham Lincoln, nominated for the presidency by his party in Chicago at the Republican Convention in 1860. And the words were still floating about Lincoln when the South secedes and we have a civil war as a result. Now, as quiet as it is kept, the Underground Railroad. Everyone has heard of the Underground Railroad, yes? yes? When the Republican Party, 100 plus years ago, were the party of equality and fairness and so forth, one of their unofficial national headquarters was in Chicago. Did you know that? You do now. It was right here. The Tremont, excuse me, the Fremont, try that again. The Tremont, oh, I'm thinking of a bridge in Portland, Oregon. One, two, three, four. The Tremont Hotel was in downtown Chicago. I know you've been to downtown Chicago. If you are on Dearborn Street and you're looking north towards Lake Street and you have the Goodman Theater on this side of you and you have the Oriental, oh, excuse me, the Niederlander Theater or whatever it's called now on your right, if you walk, you'll cross an alley and there's a parking garage there. That is where the Tremont Hotel was. The Tremont Hotel was owned by the family of Ira Couch, which was a family of liberals. Oh my God, liberals. They were responsible for the proliferation of the abolition movement in Chicago and in the Midwest. And as such, this hotel that they owned was kind of this unofficial headquarters for the Republican Party and shh, the Underground Railroad because this hotel was near many, many stations for the Underground Railroad. And then of course, all of these things having to do with slavery, as I mentioned, lead to the Civil War. One of the first, first, first all black regiments in the history of the United States Army, the 29th Infantry Division, which was based in what city? Chicago. Yeah, Chicago, USA, and this goes right back to Abraham Lincoln. We've had two total wars in American history. One of them was the Civil War, and one of them was World War II. And Abraham Lincoln understood the second that the South seceded, this is total war. This is uncharted territory. And he understood that a resource that wouldn't have been dreamt of by any of his predecessors, and certainly not Jefferson Davis, was black American troops, freemen or men who had already who had been born free or escaped slaves, many escaped slaves risking repatriation to the South were happy to sign up and go and fight on the cause of the Union. So let's get back to that Underground Railroad because you still need it during the Civil War. This gentleman here, born outside of Chicago, arriving in Chicago, his name was John Johnson, believe it or not. Let me double check that. There's so many names there. John Jones. I was thinking of the Cowboys owner. Sorry. Uh, John Jones was a tailor. Big shot in downtown Chicago. Very well to do. Anytime you got a bow tie on, you're, you're having a good day. He was a tailor by day. Yes, sir. What's your inseam? By night, in the basement, he had 
a station for the Underground Railroad. And if you went around, if we could get in a time machine and go back to strategically located cities in the North and in the Midwest, and we went downstairs into their basements, we would find stations for the Underground Railroad. And indeed, Mr. Jones here had a station in his basement. There were many stations in downtown Chicago. He had just one of them. This guy, this is the only picture I could find of this remarkable family that was originally from Virginia before civil, the Civil War. This gentleman's name, as you can see, he's either a doctor or a ventriloquist. Um, <laughs> here is the, his name, I just thought of that joke too. His name was Dr. Peter Hudlin. His family, the Hudlin family from Virginia, almost all of them were able to escape from slavery. So how your whole family is able to escape from slavery is some kind of a team effort. Many of them came to Chicago. Some of them went to Missouri. This is the only picture I could find. This was Peter Hudlin, Dr. Peter Hudlin. He went to Missouri. His brother, Joseph Hudlin, went to Chicago because Chicago was a little further away from the Mason-Dixon line. All of these Hudlins who escaped slavery set up Underground Railroad stations in their various businesses and, 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 Joseph Hudlin and his wife, a school teacher in Chicago, not only did they set up a station for the Underground Railroad, but shortly after the Civil War was over, the city of Chicago, ah, the fire. So you're in downtown Chicago, and you're a well-to-do person. It's like, oh, there's a fire. Oh, it's on the south side, no problem. It's on the west side, no problem. Don't worry about it. And then the wind shifted. And the fire starts moving north through downtown Chicago. The average American, and you know this, would say, well, you guys are on your own. I'm out. Joseph Hudlin and his wife hung around their area previously, which was this um, uh, station for the Underground Railroad. They helped people trying to escape from downtown Chicago, from the fire. So twice over, they were heroic for no glorification, no gain, except for helping other people on their own. A wonderful thing, the Hudlin family. So the city of Chicago, clean slate because of a fire. Funny how when things burn down, you got a clean slate and a whole bunch of new people move into Chicago because Chicago is the fastest growing city in the world for about 100 years. Now, I said 1830. I want you to remember this. 1833, Chicago was incorporated as a town, 400 people. 1837, incorporated as a city, 4,000 people. Everybody got that? There'll be a quiz in a minute. One of our first prominent African Americans who arrives, she arrives eventually, but this woman, this is the storm that Patty was referring to, the calm before the storm. This woman, what was her name, everybody? Ida B. Wells, and what did we just do for Ida B. Wells? Congress Parkway is now called Ida B. Wells. God bless this city for doing that. Because let me tell you something. Maybe with the exception of Bertha Palmer and Oprah Winfrey, there's never been a more two-fisted woman in Chicago coming in with a right hook and then a left uppercut. But before she got to Chicago and started kicking people's butts in Chicago, here, she was out in, she was down in the South where she was originally from, and she was on a train. Newsflash, trains were segregated back in the 1800s. So she's on this train in Memphis, and some white people get on, the train is full, conductor, lady, you're going to have to get up or a little gal or whatever he says. She said, no, I'm not moving anywhere. So he put her off the train. So what did she do? She sued the railroad, dun dun dun, dun and she won. Not only putting everybody on notice in the immediate future and in her immediate path. Oh, here comes Ida B. Wells. Let me hide behind this thing. But anytime a court of law in this country, and we all know this, sides with you and what your legal argument is, you got some muscle. And once precedent is set in any level, any level of court in this nation of ours, you've got someone who has, maybe you'll come across, who will have a similar problem to yours down the line, and they can use what you did as a model for their experiences. So, now that she's put her foot in the backside of this railroad company, she's loosened up in the bullpen, she's gonna come to Chicago and kick some more butt. More about her in a minute. 
Before she kicked butt, she met a fellow, and Cupid kicked her butt. This is Ferdinand Barnett, who was one of the first African-American publishers in Chicago. He published a newspaper called the Chicago Conservative. He took one look at Ida B. Wells, and it was love at first sight. And they married, and you could make the argument that they were the second power couple in the history of Chicago after Bertha and Potter Palmer. Look at this picture. Now that is a family. And here she is as an old woman, and it looks like she's saying, what are you looking at? I'm Ida B. Wells. What have you done lately? And here he is going, well, I might publish a newspaper, but the boss of my house is Mrs. Barnett. Go talk to my wife. Yeah, with their children and some of their grandchildren, a wonderful, wonderful family, but her story is not over yet, because this is the only person who rates two mentions in this whole hour we're going to be together, Ida B. Wells. So, anybody know who this was? Her name was Lucia Parsons. She was born in Texas. She met a gentleman, a former, conf and you, as you can see, she was um, a mixture of African American blood and Native American blood, and there might have been some Mexican blood in there. She met a fellow, a, con a former Confederate soldier in Texas by the name of Albert Parsons. And politics be what they were. They fell in love. They were both two radicals, both two would-be anarchists, hellions. And so what do hellions do when they fall in love and get married? They move to Chicago. <laughs> and this is them. And Albert Parsons was already on his way to be a, being a legend. He was uh, undoubtedly, his effort to be a legend, I don't think he was trying to do it this way, was burnished when he was hanged for his activity at the Haymarket riot in 1886. Lucy Parsons, who was already her own thing, and already a star as far as the radicals and weirdos and general really cool Chicago people like me, she picked up his baton that he dropped whilst being hanged and ran with it. And she was one of many, many incredible social reformist voices that we had, not only in Chicago in general, but women. We, Chicago, one of the things we can all be proud of, the tradition of brilliant women that at one time or another called Chicago home or their workplace or whatever. Lucy Parsons, Albert Parsons, we've had two power couples. Wow, you didn't know you were coming for a romance, did you? So, speaking of romance, people fall in love and they have babies, and generally speaking, they need a hospital. How about that for a segue? Uh, this is Provident Hospital. How many of you have heard of Provident Hospital? Yeah, Provident Hospital. Now, if you were to go to Hyde Park and try to find Provident Hospital today, it is surrounded by these huge, huge superstructures and everything. However, roughly 100 years ago and before, this was the only building of Provident Hospital. And this was the United States first integrated hospital. Moreover, not only was this America's first integrated hospital, but during one of our tremendous race riots in Chicago, and there were four, I believe, this was the only place that gave aid and shelter and succor to anybody no matter what the color of their skin was. And this riot that we'll get into in a little bit was uh, something else. Provident Hospital had this man as a resident. His name was Dr. Dale Williams. Wasn't that his name? Daniel Hale Williams, I'm sorry. Dale Daniel, I kind of spliced two names together. Daniel Hale Williams, an African-American doctor, performed the first open heart surgery in American history in the city of Chicago. And we can claim this, too, as part of our heritage and our pride. Now, dun, 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 who remembers what the population was when Chicago was incorporated as a town in 18? 33. Beautiful. 60 years later, 1893, this opens. A brand new White Castle there in Bronzeville. Wait, let me try that again. A brand new White Castle in Bronzeville. <laughs> Thank you. The World's Fair of 1893. By this point, the population of Chicago was well over a million ten. 60 years. And you think you got problems with your expansion. Yeah, so the World's Fair opens, and Chicago, everybody who's got anything to do with the fair knows this is our moment. This is the moment we become a world-class city. And 
And indeed it was. Six months the fair was open, 27 million paid people came to see the fair. Paid people. A whole lot of people like me probably snuck back in a couple of three times without, after paying once. This is when the population of the United States was 64 million people. And of course, as one of the proud members of the community, there's plenty of homage and plenty of salutation and so forth and recognition of African Americans, right? Somebody snickered. Yes, that is the correct answer is snicker. Yeah, they didn't want to have anything to do with black people, much less acknowledging what was going on. And so the African American community in Chicago said, oh, hell no. We want some recognition. You're welcome, sir. We want some recognition. And so the, the powers that be said, okay, we'll recognize you. We'll give you one day in six months. And we'll call it Colored People's Day. <laughs> So, rather than start a riot, because there'll be plenty of those in the future, they said, okay, we'll take this day. And they took advantage of this day. In addition to having a battery of influential speakers, like Frederick Douglass, who was the keynote speaker, coming into town and this Colored People's Day and all of this thing, they had all kinds of things paying tribute to black contributions, not only in Chicago, but around the country. And one of the things that happened during Colored People's Day was this. I only recently found out about this. Oh, look, gonna, let me come back to Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells, by this point in the World's Fair, Ida B. Wells had taken up as her major cause lynching because no president of the United States acknowledged that lynching happened in America, even though everybody in this room has been in a town where lynching not only happened, but it was celebrated. Picture, people would take pictures. James Baldwin wrote a short story called The Outing. Open up your favorite adult beverage, sit down and read that, and then get back to me. The holocaustic activity of lynching still gets underplayed and still gets downplayed because in the American media, film and television, when we see a depiction of lynching, we see a nice, neat silhouette of a black man hanging from a tree. Would that it was that clean and that simplified. Some of the things that were done to people were absolutely incredible and the American government predictably didn't care. So Ida B. Wells, even, even a pen and ink drawing of her, she's looking like she's ready to slap somebody. And she was. She went to Frederick Douglass and said, Mr. Douglass, how can I get these people in this country and the President and the Congress and the Senate and the Supreme Court to care about people being lynched? He says, you treat Western nations like you would a teenager. I'm pra paraphrasing. When you want a teenager to do something, Nothing stronger than peer pressure. Nothing stronger than peer pressure. So he says to her, go to Europe and start talking smack about the United States to all of these European governments. Every European government generally hates the United States anyway. They will go out of their way to shame these people into action. So she caught the next thing smoking to Europe and within months, all of a sudden, every big shot around the continent of Europe and in the United Kingdom, sending all of these wires and so forth, and every time the President of the United States broke bread with any big shot, any diplomat from Europe. So, tell us about lynching, and the President's like, uh, dem, uh, uh. It was, Woodrow Wilson was the first President to acknowledge that there had ever been anybody lynched in the United States, and he only did so because he was getting driven crazy by black people during uh, uh, World War I. That's a whole nother story. So, now, skipping ahead, something that I just found out recently. There was a Congress of African Nations that happened during the World's Fair, during Colored People Day. And not only did all of these nations of Africa come together for the first time, they invited representatives from the African American community in the United States. And this was unprecedented and it set the standard for many subsequent and similar meetings, most notably the Bang Dung Conference of 1954. If any of you are scholars as far as being into Malcolm X, Malcolm X mentions the, conference, the Bang Dung Conference of 1954 in one of his most legendary speeches, the ballot to the bullets, ballot or the bullet. Uh, 
I thought there was a mouse. <laughs> That's Brittany, everybody. Give it up for Brittany. Let's embarrass her a little bit. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Um, yeah, and so the Bangtan Conference, all of these nations from Africa and South America and Asia coming together to talk about this new era of nationalism and Europe not gonna like this era of nationalism but we're gonna kick some backside and talk a little shop so this was really cool and this was the first time governments actually recognized black people in Chicago as people as opposed to former slaves and children of former slaves and things of this nature and you had every black college and university in America said at the very least a choir or an orchestra or scholars and things of this nature to show the world hey we got colored people's day but we are making a contribution to American society in fact the Chicago Tribune the week leading up to colored people day kind of lampooned it in their articles and chuckling oh black people what do they know and all this kind of stuff and then two days later the same writer, uh, my bad, this was some cool stuff, out, and he's gone. And so finally, the city of Chicago, and thus the world, are starting to recognize, hey, black people are more than former slaves. Look, who thought it? So, oh, that last, oh, you're welcome. That last picture was a picture of the Hampton University Choir, which included a very, very young man making his first trip to Chicago by the name of Robert Abbott. Hang on to that name. We're going to get to him in a minute. So, part of the legend. We're still on the World's Fair. Musicians, black people in every walk of life, but especially musicians coming to Chicago to see what's going on. Scott Joplin arrives in Chicago during the World's Fair, and he perfects this syncopated style of jazz that he's been tinkering around with. He essentially completes the construction of ragtime music when he arrives in Chicago, which is pretty cool. All of these people are coming up to the so-called white city as it was. People like Jelly Roll Morton. People, all of these people are making their, their living as, a mu as musicians and so forth and other jobs. Like, wow, there's like this big metropolis here and there's sections for black people. This is great. Hmm. If we, as black people around the United States living in rural areas, ever need to relocate to bigger cities where there'll be opportunities, we maybe should go to Chicago. And I'm sure they said it just like that, sounding like howdy doody, too. Now, one of the neighborhoods that was immediately and profoundly affected by this influx of African American musicians into Chicago was an area that would be known as the Stroll. The Levy District in the South Loop, which was essentially where people like Al Capone and Johnny Torrio and all, and many, 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 many prostitutes got their start. Uh, immediately south of, of uh, the Levy District was this area known as the Stroll, and it was Chicago's answer to Harlem during the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. And if you were a black person living in Chicago back then, and you had five bucks in your pocket, and you wanted to have some fun, that's where you went, to the stroll. Some of the nightclubs were legendary. The, oh, I put this music on here. Jo Joseph Jordan, the Pekin Rag. This is some sheet music that was printed from the day. The Pekin Club in the stroll was this legendary nightclub where all of these jazz musicians, and remember, this is 100 years ago. Jazz music in America, the most American form of music born in th on this continent was in its infancy then. And Chicago, the pipeline between Chicago and New Orleans and Chicago to New York had everything to do with it. Before we all get offended, I want you to stop and have a look at this. So, one of the many products that was introduced to the world at the World's Fair, along with Cracker Jacks and cream, cream of Wheat and the greatest beer in the world, Pabst Blue Ribbon, <laughs> was Aunt Jemima as a self-contained throw it in there, throw some water in or some milk if you got paid yesterday, and then you got some pancake dough. And the Aunt Jemima company not only elected to have it named after a former slave or a mammy type of character, they put her smiling visage on the cover. Now, with our 2019 sensibilities, this is extremely offensive. However, 
125 years ago, a smiling picture like this was not thought to be offensive. In fact, many people remarked like, wow, that's actually kind of a positive image compared to some of the other contemporaneous ones where you had some of the nastiest depictions of black people on packaging and so forth. This is, this is a smiling person. She, I mean, except for the do-rag, she could be playing Othello. Um, that's a joke. Thank you very much for that unsolicited response. Yeah, so I'm pointing this out because the image used of black people in advertising has come a long way. And so this is our first look at it this afternoon. So we have a blackface mammy type of character thought to be a positive image on a national product that would become an international product. World's Fair time, baby. So, bam, Chicago explodes. A million and ten in 1893. By the early part of the 20th century, it's already creeping up on a million and a half people. This gentleman here, his name was Jesse Binga. Jesse Binga arrived in Chicago shortly after the turn of the century with $10 in his pocket. By the time, he, he ultimately resided in Hyde Park. By the time he passed away, some 40, 50 years later, he had built from that $10 that he had in his wallet, a real estate and banking empire. And that's wonderful for him, and anybody who's named in his will, that's a wonderful thing. But for black Americans in general, it's wonderful because, hey, Here's somebody who really got it done, and he got it done on his own accord, and he got it done through grit and determination and smarts. So it's out there for us if we know how to attack it, and we do so with zeal. Ah, uh, So, when we think of social work in Chicago, who do we think of? Hull House, yes ma'am. Jane Addams. Jane Addams was a wonderful woman, however, she was a vicious racist. Yeah. Roughly one third of us in this room, if we needed the Hull House 100 years ago, we would have been turned away at the door because she suspected black people in general and black men specifically. Don't let black men around anybody or liquor because we can't control ourselves. Um, and I wasn't even born yet. Um, so, we have, moving from the East, Dr. Fanny Emanuel, a doctor in social work, and she sees this problem, and once again, it's another one of our angels in Chicago with regard to social work. Social work wasn't invented in Chicago, but it was perfected. Dr. Fanny Emanuel opens the first integrated settlement house or site of social work in the American experience, Emanuel Settlement House in Chicago. That's really important. Now, let me ask you something. One of the problems that we have as Americans is we tend to perceive people who are not like us as monolithic. All black people think the same way. All women think and act the same way. This, that, and the other thing. Who here has four or more brothers and sisters in this room? Ma'am, do you and all of your brothers and sisters think the same? No, we don't. No, you don't. And you're from the same womb, for goodness sake. So. Part of the problem, or part of the solution to all of our problems individually and collectively is let's not assume there's a monolith. And so as Chicago's growing, we have middle income black people and then we got rich black people moving to Chicago. Who's this everybody? The boxer. The boxer. Yeah, you can tell by the muscles. Yeah. Jack Johnson, the first African American heavyweight champion from Texas, essentially in pursuit of the title, he takes on every white person around the world. He, everybody is rooting against him who is white. And he flattened his opponent, walks away with the belt, and once you get a title, once you get a belt, you move to Chicago. Because you got money to spend. I'm not staying in Lindell, Texas. I'm moving to, woo woo, chi -town. He moves to Chicago, and not only does he tear up the joint, and believe me, he does. He opens up his own restaurant, the Cafe des Champions. Oh, a French oh, don't get too impressed because that's how he made his money. How he spent his money was by patronizing brothels a few blocks away from the Café des Champions. Most notably, the Everlay Club. How many of you have heard of the Everlay Club? Yes, ma'am. One of the most notorious brothels 
ever in the history of the world and before Jack Johnson showed up at the door with a wad of cash it was segregated. He personally integrated a brothel. <laughs> and as much as I would like to say that I was making that up and I'm hilarious, that's absolutely what happened. My father and I, and my father's a historian too, we were talking about this and I had, you know how when you make some, some pop come out of somebody's nose because they're laughing? It was a good day because like a whole can of Coke came out of my old man's nose just talking about Jack Johnson. Yeah, Jack Johnson, the Jackie Robinson of brothels here in the United States. Middle income, lower income, higher income, this, that, black Republicans. Remember, the Republican Party was originally the party of choice for black people. Black Democrats, this, that, Elks. We have lodges. We got Masons. We got Elks. I put this image up here to not only illustrate that, welcome Elks, dun 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 dun, Elk meeting, come on in everybody and bring your money. They are welcoming, as one of their national figures, Tenen Jones, Tenen Jones. Oh, I just happened to have a picture of Tenen Jones right here. Now look at this respectable looking fellow. He looks like he might be a preacher, or he might be a college, university president or something. By day, he was a very respectable gentleman on the south side of Chicago. By night, not so much. He created policy numbers in Chicago. Oh, yeah, policy. Playing the numbers, baby. Combinate, as he used to say. And that this is the paramutual lottery. Yeah, and if you had a dollar, with some luck, you could make $300. And back before 1950, $300 was a whole lot of money. And most importantly, as far as you and I here today, the policy number system in Chicago was the basis for every state lottery in this great nation. But do any of his descendants get a royalty check? Nope. So next time you play, does anybody here play the lottery? No, it's too invasive of a question. Next, moving right along. Now, remember I mentioned Robert Abbott? who came to Chicago first with the choir, with the Hampton University for the World's Fair. He, like so many people, he stepped off the train, took a look around, fell in love with Chicago, and said, I'm coming back here. And he did. And he got himself a nice little place in Bronzeville, and he decided he wanted to go into publishing and journalism. And on the kitchen table of his landlady, he published a newsletter. And then the newsletter became a weekly newspaper. And then ultimately, in a couple of decades, a daily paper. That was the Chicago Defender. And the Chicago Defender was without question the definitive voice in African American press in the latter, in the, from about 1925 to about 1980. It was the voice, but in so many ways it affected our experience here. Because our experience, we as Americans, and this little plot of earth that we share, is fixing to change incredibly. We have a confluence of factors coming together. What is this, everybody? I didn't think you'd know. This is a bow weevil. Yeah, we gotta have a bunch of, we need a room full of southerners to recognize a bow weevil. Bow weevil! So after the Civil War, we had an advent in uh, the southern states called Jim Crow. As Jim Crow was getting bigger and bigger, and the people who are really, really mistreating black people in the South, as they are emboldened by the government's indifference to it, the Bo Weevil decides to come on down and de starts destroying cash crops in the South. So if you are a sharecropper, barely eking by anyway, and you make, turn in all of this cotton, and then you get a dollar. I know, that's, can't, that can't go very far. And then, if the guy who just pays you, has just paid you, overhears you belly aching, you might get lynched for your trouble. It's time to think about relocation. And at roughly the same time, people in the South were starting to get the same idea. You know, the Southern economy is kind of jacked up and that you might get killed in pursuit of it is extremely jacked up. At this precise moment, newspapers, especially Defender, every day in editorials, they were urging people, move, it's time to go, move. Skip all this other stuff, move. So people said, you know what? I'm about, I've about had it. Looking over my shoulder, I might get lynched. My wife might get raped. My kids aren't safe. So people literally, you had whole families 
Jay, all right, we're going tomorrow. Everybody got one suitcase. You put what you could in that suitcase, and then you caught the first thing going to the north. And in the case of Chicago, the Illinois Central Line, all of these farm communities fed right up the IC tracks into the south side of Chicago, and the population of the United States changed, and it will never ever change back. You had roughly 80% of African Americans moving from the rural south to cities like New York and Newark and Boston, Detroit, Chicago, all of these things. And, 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 this is at the tail end of the Industrial Revolution. So you have got factories exploding all over the place, and they can't find enough workers to work. So they start sending recruiters around to southern towns. Hey, farmer, come here. You want to make in a day what you make here in a month? Come to Chicago. Come to Chicago with me. And all of these people start to pursue it. And then during World War I, it got to a crisis, crisis state as far as lynching and so forth in the southern states. And so the Great Migration is exactly what we're talking about. I forgot to click the, there's your Jim Crow image for you. The confluence of the Bow Weevil and Jim Crow driving black people up to the north. Now, ah, what's this everybody? It's a train car. It's a Pullman. Yes, ma'am, it's a Pullman. So the 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated. Other than that, how did you like the theater, Mrs. Lincoln? Um, <laughs> yes, thank you for the. <laughs> so, I, know, I didn't make that joke up. It would have been much worse. So, President Lincoln's body was born in this special railroad car created by George Pullman. George Pullman, who was already a Chicago legend because he had hydraulically lifted up sections of the streets and buildings all over downtown Chicago so the sewage system could be unified. He was already a legend and he could have rested on his laurels. Hello, Laurel, how are you? And rested on it. That's a bad one. Um, and so President Lincoln is killed and they're planning this spectacle, obviously, of a funeral for him. So his train is going to wind its way from Washington, D.C., hit every big city along the way, including Chicago, and then ultimately come to its final stop in Springfield. George Pullman comes up with this beautiful, beautiful car to bear the president's body. Millions of people. That's the president. Man. Boy, this is a nice rail car. This is man, man, my next trip across the country. I'd like to lay down, not quite to that extent, but I'd like to lay down and take a little nap. So George Bowen's like, hmm, people won't go to sleep. The wheels are turning and he comes up with the Pullman sleeper car. Now let me, you have one chance to answer this question correctly, ladies and gentlemen. Who do you think had no problem taking that kind of job? Yeah, yeah, so African American men, mostly in Chicago, applied by the probably thousands. And this is important because not only did you have, for the first time in the American experience, a job available to many, many black men that would help them into the middle class, and you didn't need a degree to be, a, you just needed to be smart and have good manners. So I guess I wouldn't have been able to apply for that job. Um, thank you. These people started to raise up the economic situation of blacks, and Robert Abbott, smart dude, the Defenders of Day, a weekly newspaper at this point, he go, oh, and this is the first union in America for black people. Yeah, yeah. See, this is, it's hard for me to keep all this together. Yeah. My grandfather was a Pullman Ford. He's not in that picture, is he? Oh, he's, he was, my grandfather. If you bring me a picture of your granddad, I'll put him in there instead of these guys. Okay. And then I'll, and, I'll, and I'll claim it's my grandfather. But. <laughs> <laughs> so, Robert Abbott, he sees all of these people, all of these black men who live on the south side of Chicago going all over the country. So he goes to him and he says, hey, fellas, here's 100 copies of The Defender. Sell them while you're out there, you keep 40%, bring back 60. So you have this built-in system for getting the word out there. And that's brilliant anyway, but this is the first time a black American publication becomes truly 
a nationwide publication and using the, the, the Pullman Porters, it transcends the south side of Chicago. And all the news that was fit to be printed about black people in America was being said by the Chicago Defender. So, we moved to the north. This was to remind me to mention the Great Migration. I think I did. Black Americans moved to the north, however, look at this, 93, 80%. Jobs weren't much better in the North. Racial hatred in the North. Women often worked as low-paid domestics. I've been related to some people who came up through the Great Migration. And you came to Chicago, you went to Detroit, you went to St. Louis thinking, ah, it's Shangri-La. It was not. However, you did have a better shot at getting a higher paying job. That was about it. That was the one advantage straight away. So, World War I ends. And in 19 and 19, 100 years ago this summer, we had a rash of race riots around the United States. Did you know that? 1919? 19 and 19, yes ma'am. And there was one in Chicago that started as a result. Oh, by the way, did you know that beaches were segregated in Chicago up until 1966? Oh. Yeah. There was a segregated beach at, I think it was 31st Street Beach. Yeah. And there was a line of demarcation. Black folks here, white folks here. And that line of demarcation ran into the water. Problem is, hard to see a line in the water, isn't it? Especially if you're swimming. And three young African-American boys, and they were boys in their early teens, were swimming. And you might be, the, you might be Mark Spitz and Matt Biondi and Aquaman and the Submariner, but you're not going to swim stronger than the current. They got pushed over the Mendoza line. The whites around them started to holler and scream and throw rocks. One of the boys got hit in the head and drowned. When the cops scrambled out there to see what was up and all this commotion, there's a dead African-American young man there. Whose side do you think they took? And there's your riot. Black people said, oh, hell no. White people said, oh, hell yeah. And all of this came together. The 1919 riot in Chicago was so legendary that businesses closed down in the loop. The union, stock yard, union stockyards closed for two weeks during the race riots in 19 and 19. And then once they reopened, they told the black people, stay home for another couple of weeks. There was a young man living in Bridgeport. If you know Chicago, you know how close Bridgeport is to Bronzeville. And Bridgeporters hated the idea that black people were so close. And so when the riots spread, they were worried that black folk, because there was no Dan Ryan Expressway then, that black people were going to wander over starting trouble and we didn't however this did not stop one club they're called the Hamburg Club from walking around policing the joint with baseball bats and billy clubs and so forth looking for black people their president led the pack their president was a young man of 18 at the time <coughs> named Richard J. Daly oh, oh my God. you knew that was coming didn't you <coughs> Yeah, racial history in America is difficult, but we ain't nobody going anywhere, so we gotta get through this together. So the riots, and then, so you got riots going on all over the United States, racially oriented riots, and anytime anybody of, who was an African American or a Latino for that matter, they're reading the wire service, and every story is swayed towards the white perspective. Well, that's a shock because the company was owned by rich white people. So, this gentleman here, his name was Claude Barnett. 19 and 19, he says, you know what? We need a wire service that will get our view out there. So international uh, news companies who pick up these stories from the wire, they will, they will see that there's at least two sides to every story. So, in 19 and 19, Mr. Burnett starts the Associated Negro Press the Black Wire Service on the south side of Chicago. Sears Roebuck and Company. You've heard of Sears Roebuck and Company, right? I want to ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. If you, if you in this room were ever followed in a store by a store detective or somebody working there and you felt it was probably because of the color of your skin, I want you to smile at me right now. <laughs> 
Oh, you don't have to jump up, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The first time I moved to the suburbs, and I was walking through Mon Montgomery Ward. So many people were following me that everybody else in the joint robbed the joint blind because nobody else. <laughs> so in that way, it was it, the plan worked. Yeah. And so imagine being a northerner and dealing with this. How do you think southerners felt? Southern black people. So I'm not going to this store getting shaken down and accused of, 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 of theft and you've got the receipt and everything. Here's Roebuck, the, 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 the basis for the internet today in many ways. You could order everything from a Sears catalog, yeah. from a toothbrush to a completely fabricated house and put your house together. The plumbing, the wiring, they, they didn't send a carpenter along, but I imagine if you paid extra, there'd be one. So black people in the South and on the South side of Chicago and in some of the uh, more um, difficult neighborhoods undergoing racial change, like, I'm not going into the Sears. Oh. I'll order everything from the Sears catalog because I'm just a number. I'm just a telephone number. I'm just a post office box. So I'm sure the owners of Sears Roebuck had no idea that they were contributing so mightily to <laughs> racial equality in America, but they did. The Sears catalog, the unwitting tool of racial harmony all throughout this nation of ours. The middle class continues to grow and we have examples of how we have a very disparate group of voices, never a monolithic voice. This was the South Side Art Center, presumably on the South Side. In Chicago, and what are these people doing? They're sitting around, hairdos, shine shoes, ties, talking about art. So we never see pictures like this, and certainly people of the times never saw pictures of black people being just regular Americans, because that's the whole point. Everybody's a regular American. As jacked up as we all are, we're all jacked up together. And at the same time, some of you laughed, you should have. <laughs> the Southside YMCA, excuse me, the Wabash Avenue YMCA, back in the day, some of you my age and older will remember these days, back in, in the day, you could go to the YMCA and check out library books, you could go work out, if you, if you got thrown out by your, your lady, you could get a bed there for the night. Oh yeah, you could, do, you could do all kinds of things. And you could go and experience culture. All kinds of things. You could go to all of these meetings and so forth. It wasn't just a crash pad. And so the Wabash Avenue YMCA became the regular meeting place for this committee, this group that got together to publish a monthly publication called, excuse me, the Journal of Negro History. Yeah. And they had people not just from all over Chicago and all over the country came to Chicago to contribute and so forth. And one of those people was this guy. His name was Carter Whitson. He was, yeah, he was a, an educator in Washington, D.C. and a regular participant. He comes in at one of the meetings in 1928. He says, you know what? Right around President Lincoln's birthday, since we, back in the day, we used to only uh, recognize it. He says, let's set aside a week with, right around President Lincoln's birthday will be called Black History Week. Yeah. <laughs> and it's grown into a month. And that's an idea that was hatched on the south side of Chicago in 1928. Speaking of 1928, this is Thomas A. Dorsey. A preacher, a musician, a composer, and, and nobody wore a white suit like this guy. Prior to the man from GLAD, nobody wore a white suit like this guy. And he was a composer, and in 1928, Pilgrim Avenue Baptist Church, I believe, is where his uh, pulpit was, his congregation. He was experimenting with a new kind of music, which was a combination of choir music, orchestra music, traditional blues music, and re religious non-secular religious music. It was called what? Gospel. Gospel. And his his foil, or I should say his tool, Mahalia Jackson, all of, I believe, 20 years old she was, and she came up to Chicago, met him, they became instant best friends, instant buddies, and you know, if you're going to invent a, a, a genre of music, it helps to have Mahalia Jackson as your <laughs> spokeswoman. Yeah. South side of Chicago, gospel is invented. But wait, there's more. So how many here have ever gone to a rent party? 
Heard yeah, you've heard of them. Rent party is, oh man, rent's due tomorrow. I don't have enough rent. Ah, this is what I'll do. I'll take the little money I have, spend all of that money on booze, food, and I'll hire some musicians, some local musicians, right. and throw a party and charge admission. And then you make your rent and you make a little, there's a whole episode of the Sanford and Son about it. It was a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> Life revolves around Sanford and Son. So, Usually these house musicians were really happy, a dollar per person, you know, guy on bass, guy on guitar, guy on piano, maybe a person singing. They called this music skiffle. Skiffle from before World War I eventually makes it across the United States and then across the Atlantic Ocean and skiffle music more anglicized by this point descends on the ears of who? Come on, rock musician historians. All of the first generation of English rock stars, starting with the Beatles, all the way, they all said that they listened to skiffle music, albeit the Liverpoolian or the British version of it, but it was skiffle music, which started as house music, Sazaid. And just so you know, I put this picture in here not only because this guy looks cool, this is a K Super Jumbo acoustic guitar. Made in Chicago. Chicago was the biggest manufacturer of inexpensive but good guitars, inexpensive but good pianos from about 1925 to about 1970. This is one of the reasons so many important musicians are from Chicago. Moving on up, speaking of which, so you're a Delta Blues musician. Oh, it's three o'clock. Is everybody good? We got about another 15 minutes. Is everybody cool? Good. So, you're a Delta Blues musician and you move up north to Chicago. Hey, you know what? I want to get a job singing. Oh, I heard that there's this wonderful outdoor marketplace called Maxwell Street <laughs> where, they, where they hire live musicians. Beautiful. Take my guitar there. Hello, sir. How do you do? Five dollars for the day. I'm down. Sit down and you sing for six hours acoustically over all that noise. And then by the end of the day, this is how you sound. Oh, my baby and I. And so, man, my voice is jacked up. Ah, I live in Chicago. I'll go to Sears Roebuck. I'll go and buy a very cheap electronical gadget guitar, an electronical gadget amplifier, and a cheap microphone. I'll plug them all in and I'll start screaming this traditional Delta Blues over all this noise. That marriage of electricity to Delta Blues created Chicago Blues. So when you go to a blues club, the first song, if they say they're Chicago Blues, that man or woman singing should be hollering at everybody because that is Chicago Blues. And not, that's even before you had to get a parking spot. Oh, no, all right. Yes, yes, yes. So, flight. I don't think it's a coincidence that some of the legends of flight are from Chicago and some of the legends of flight in America, the earliest ones, are of minorities. There was a gentleman by the name of Cornelius Coffey who wanted to learn how to fly, an African American gentleman. And there's a flight school in the South Loop on Michigan Avenue just south of Roosevelt. So he's like, I'm going to learn to fly. Woohoo, zoom, zoom. And he shows up. And rather than letting him enroll, they hand him a broom and say, the only thing we got for you is a janitor's gig. So rather than take the broom and hit the guy in the head with it, which would have been really tempting, Mr. Coffey took the job. And so he's at the place every day, sweeping up, cleaning up and everything, giving him access to information. And so he starts to construct his own textbook and his own curriculum, goes and pays for his own flying time, learns how to fly, and starts teaching other people, including this one. Who is this, everybody? Bessie, Bessie Coleman. Yes. yes. And not only was she great in her own right, but she went, you know, all things being equal and, you know, generosity, she taught these guys. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> all because of one African-American person on the south side of Chicago and, 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 it's just a great coincidence that while Bessie Coleman was learning to fly on the west side of Chicago, a young woman by the name of Amelia Earhart yeah. was just getting ready to go into her career flight on the south side of Chicago. Mm. Yeah. 
pretty cool. Amelia Earhart, Bessie Coleman. It doesn't get much better than that. But wait a minute. We'll try to get it better than that. Ah, Marquette girl. I told you it was coming. A graduate of Marquette University, University of Marquette, and a graduate of the Ohio State University. Who are those people? Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf. Absolutely. M Ralph Metcalf was a couple of years older than Jesse, than Jesse Owens, and I'm sure they had no idea. They're just running a meet. They would, be, they would have this symbiotic relationship to this day. Ralph Metcalf from the south side of Chicago winds up on the 1932 Olympic team, and he wins a gold medal. It's in Los Angeles, one of the great, great American-hosted Olympiads ever. Four years later, where's the Olympics? Berlin. And there was a wonderful fellow by the name of Hitler who was running the, company, the country at the same time. Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf find themselves on this team and two of the few African Americans on the team and they win a gold medal together in the four by 100 meter relay and so they have the honor of shaking hands with the Fuhrer. Pardon my cold hand. Shockingly, Adolf Hitler found something better to do that afternoon than shake these fellas' hands. They went down in history together. Ralph Metcalf, of course, moves back to Chicago, becomes an alderman. Very important alderman. There is a building in the Federal Plaza in downtown Chicago at the junction of Jackson and Clark that is named in his honor. Ralph Metcalf. Ah, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. So, leave it to a Chicagoan like me, to be a genius. That's Benny Goodman from Douglas Park. And you, did you know that? Is Benny Goodman? Yeah. Very good. Oh, okay, well then who's this? The drummer. Um. <laughs> How did you know it was the drummer? <laughs> That's okay, I know you know it, it's on the tip of your tongue. So, he was also from Chicago, his name was Gene Krupa. Yes. Many people yes. to this day yes. say that he was the best drummer of all time. Benny Goodman loved talent. Recruit, recruit, recruit. But the funny thing is, before World War II, like everything in America, jazz music was segregated. So you might go to a million jam sessions and steal all kinds of licks from all kinds of people. But then, once the cameras came on and once people started paying admission, you'd have a white band in a white ballroom and a black band in a black ballroom. Well, Benny Goodman, being a Chicago one, said, forget this. I'm recruiting talent. I want talent. So he integrates American jazz at the Congress Plaza Hotel on Easter Sunday, 1936. And to do so, he brings this man, Teddy Wilson, in. And then he's emboldened by this in his first great quartet, the Benny Goodman Quartet. He's got Krupp, he's got himself, he's got Teddy Wilson. And who do you think that is? I know you know it. I, I, Don't hit yourself when I say I Lionel Hampton. Yes. yes. So, jazz music. Like I will always argue, the most American form of music. Integrated in Chicago, Easter Sunday, 1936. Oh my God. This is Mr. John H. Johnson, who was a publisher. He had an idea for a couple of publications. The Negro Digest is how they started out. And then he thought, well, this is great. And the popularity soared and soared and soared. And then they split off to Ebony and Jet magazine. The first black man, the first black person, I beg your pardon, to be on the Forbes 400 list of influential money big shots. And of course, you know you're something if you bought your own building. That's, that was the Ebony Jet building. It's been recently purchased as more and more publications, hard copy publications die because of the internet and everything. That's now part of Columbia College, the Ebony Jet building, the building there. Just as you can see, a half a block down from the Hilton Tower and Plaza, which was when I was a little kid called the, the Conrad Hilton Hotel. This gentleman's name was Frank Brown. Where do you know that face from? Uh, Uncle Ben's. Uncle Ben's, yes, yes, yes. I love how you guys are recognizing. He was a concierge at a hotel in Chicago and he was so charming, so amiable, so handsome that when the Uncle Ben's company decided they wanted a face for it, they used his face, even though he had nothing to do with, ma I mean, presumably he probably had a bowl of rice at some point in his life, but he had nothing to do with the manufacturing of rice. So we've gone from the World's Fair and Jemima in blackface to this gentleman. So, 
we are making progress. And when I say we, I'm not just talking we black people. We as a nation are slowly making progress. Oh, man. Oh, oh, indeed. Does everybody know who this is? And that is his mother. Ladies and gentlemen, I've done this presentation scores of times. I get to this picture and I want to cry because I am quite sure that this is the last picture that Emmett Till and his mother were in together. Because I'm judging by his size and by a little peach fuzz on his upper lip, he's about 14 years old and he's fixing to go to visit kinfolk in Mississippi. And all of us in the African American experience of a certain age, we all had relatives who stayed in the South. Emmett Till, as a boy of 14, goes to Mississippi and he is accused of making an inappropriate remark to a white woman. This lady two years ago admitted to making the whole thing up. He was not only killed, but in such a horrifying way that when his body was taken from the train, his mother fainted at the sight of his door. Am I getting ready to show you a picture? She insisted that his coffin at the Leak Funeral Parlor on the south side of Chicago be open. And the first time I saw that picture, it broke my heart. In this horrible, horrible cloud, there is a silver lining, though. Because between the Emmett Till murder and the Montgomery bus boycott, we have the beginning of the modern civil rights movement. And then we can directly, we can trace that back to the south side of Chicago. Speaking of the civil rights movement, so we're moving into the 1960s. And even though I was a kid in the 1960s in Chicago, I had no idea about the presence of Martin Luther King in Chicago, up to and including that he and his wife moved into an apartment in Lawndale and rat infested and all of this and everything. And because he had this idea, and I didn't realize realize it at the time, because I lived in a really nice neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. You know, there were, you know, slums and so forth, but Dr. King saw a direct correlation between plantations in the south and ghettos in the north. And you can't very well desegregate only the south when you have all of this internalized, industrialized segregation and discrimination going on. So he spent a whole bunch of time in Chicago in the latter part of his career. Speaking of Chicago, this man, when he got out of prison, he had converted to the Nation of Islam, which was headquartered in Chicago, so Malcolm X, the former Malcolm Little, used to call Chicago home for a while, and if you've read his autobiography, you know that he knew in the last year of his life somebody was going to kill him. If you've not read the autobiography of Malcolm X, I would really urge you to do so. And then there's a book that came out, tragically, about four years ago called Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, where the author had spent literally 30 years working on it and died the week after it was published. Mm. Fascinating book. Malcolm X, and, and this one thing I'm going to share with you about Malcolm X. So he knew he was going to die. So about a month before he died, he was doing essentially a radio tour of everybody who would listen to him. Because he was trying to plead his case and this, that, and everything. And he came to Chicago during this tour. That is the back of the head of one Irv Cups in it. Yes, Chicago legend, and I only recently found out that not only was Mr. Malcolm X in town, to be interviewed, but he had been deposed by the U.S. attorney in the city of Chicago because they were looking to open a case against the nation of Islam that would result in losing their tax-exempt status. That is enough to get assassinated over in any city in this nation. Speaking of the civil rights movement, here in Chicago we had the great Fred Hampton, a young, charismatic voice dying way, way, way too young as a result of having been murdered by the Chicago Police Department. I believe it was December of 1969, I want to think, or 68 or 69. And this, that tumultuous period in Chicago, 68, 69, culminated in the Chicago, the Democratic Convention in Chicago. The mayor, the future mayor, not too happy about what's going on. What's that? It don't look like he was not wide open. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, the junior. Junior. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, he was he was in his twenties here. He aged a bit. Yeah. Well, let me hear. It. Does it look like him now? Yeah. So, and many people 
saw this incredible riot that occurred concurrent with the, the um, Democratic Convention as the beginning, certainly looking at it from hindsight, as the beginning of the end of the power of the Chicago political machine, and specifically the Honorable Richard J. Daley, which led directly to the tumult that resulted in not only our first African-American mayor, but our first woman mayor. Yeah, in the from the from the ashes of What's his name over there? What's his name? Right there, Gwendolyn Brooks. That's Gwendolyn Brooks. Yeah. Oh, we got, we got something about her. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go to the south side of Chicago without talk. But she's there, and she. Yeah. If we if we started going around, we could probably find a few yeah. famous people. But we don't have time for that because. Oh, oh. oh wait a minute. Uh, did you see whose name is on the door here, man? <laughs> I'm teasing you. We got we got to keep moving. So now this is where I got to pull out a list because I just did this this morning. It's easy for us to recognize the glitterati, singing stars, dancing stars, this, that, and the other thing. Let me show you something right quick. Black scientists and inventors from Chicago. This is Dr. James Bowman, a physicist. This is Otis Boykin, an inventor. George Carruthers, a space physicist. In other words, he made stuff that enabled people to go up into space. This is Skip Ellis, a computing engineer pioneer. This is Lloyd Hall, so important, there's a whole page about him there. He was a chemist. This is Carrie Coffey, still alive, a software architect. Now, this is Mae Carol Jameson, an astronaut, a, a renaissance woman. She was some kind of something, a graduate from the University of Chicago. This is Lloyd Albert Quarterman. Though not from Chicago, he was so brilliant at chemistry that he was brought to Chicago. I got to take my glasses off for effect here. For the Manhattan Project, oh, y'all. Really? Yeah. The Manhattan Project, hopefully we will never ever see yeah. anything that was a direct result of the Manhattan. The Manhattan Project is where the atom was split, nuclear fission, and the world has not been the same. Talk to the people of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. <laughs> this is Earl Renfro, who was a pioneer in dentistry. Chicago guy. Claude Mason Steele, a psychologist. He's still with us today, and he's one of those eggheads who writes all kinds of papers and books that baffle people like me, but he looks smart. <laughs> this is J. Ernest uh, Wilkins, a, a stellar, legendary mathematician. This is just inventors and scientists and doctors from the south side and the west side of Chicago. Now, the other constellation of stars. <laughs> Oprah, and this is something that's really important. Oprah Winfrey, you all recognized her, right? Arrives in Chicago at roughly 1982, right? 18 months after she arrives in Chicago, this guy arrives in Chicago. <laughs> Bear me out here. Now, those of you who are my age and older, you know that the corridor between Halstead and Damon, Washington and Madison, was one of the roughest neighborhoods in Chicago, if you had tickets to the ball game at Old Chicago Stadium, you got there and you got the hell out of the neighborhood because it was rough. Well, Oprah Winfrey arrives in Chicago, Michael Jordan arrives in Chicago, Oprah Winfrey's success leads her to build her own studio and essentially her own production company at the easternmost part of the corridor that I just mentioned, and you've probably heard of the house that Jordan built, at the westernmost point of this corridor. So now, Madison and Washington, from Halstead to Damon, some of the most jacked up condominium rates you will ever see in Chicago. And it's because these two country folk from the American South who came to Chicago, came, saw, and conquered, revitalized the West Side. This is Buck O'Neill. Did any of you see the Ken Burns film, Baseball? Of course you did, Patty. You will probably remember him much older. He died a couple of years after that film was made. Buck O'Neill was originally in the Negro League, and then once Jackie Robinson had broken the color barrier, he became a major leaguer too, and he was hired by the team that plays at 1060 West Adams. He, uh, Addison, excuse me. He was a pretty good ball player, but he was really, really smart. 
and he had a great eye. So Buck O'Neill was elevated to the point of being a scout for the Cubs. And as such, he was the first managerial level African American in professional sports history. All having to do with the Cubs. And, and please, if you love baseball, Watch Ken Burns film baseball, and um, Mr. Burns has all of these, this wonderful, just cabal of disparate voices talking about the greatness that is the national pastime. And he has Buck O'Neill. Buck O'Neill also became the first curator for the Negro Baseball Hall of Fame. And there is one moment where Buck O'Neill is talking about the purity of the sound the first time he heard Babe Ruth hit a ball, and then he heard Josh Gibson hit a ball, and then he thought he would never live to hear that song, that sound again. I'm getting goosebumps. And then Bo Jackson hit a ball in his presence. Yeah, it's wonderful. And his, he's got the most beautiful face, as you can see, and smile ever. And his face, he's an old man, but he's 20 years old when he's talking about these baseball memories. Sorry, I love baseball. Oh! <laughs> Well, waiter, I will have some frim fried potatoes with the enfant with Shafafa on the side. That's what, that's a Nat King Cole lyric. Nat King Cole came to Chicago by way of Alabama on his way to Hollywood, and he became a legend in Bronzeville as he was with his trio before he became this pop icon. Archibald Watley, an incredibly important portrait painter whose work hangs in the Art Institute of Chicago. A Chicago guy and an African American, but wait! The same family! His nephew, Willard Motley, obviously an African American gentleman, writing one of the definitive novels of the second half of the 20th century. Knock on any door, and I've read it and the whole time. I'm like, wow, this is just written from an American perspective, not a black perspective. It's, it's really, really interesting, particularly given that he was born, I think, right around the end of World War I. For him to be able to be that prescient and that entrenched with foresight and so forth. Who's next? Dinah Washington. Before she took her own life at 33 years old, Dinah Washington was on her way, Chicago girl, to being right up there with Sarah Vaughan, Ella Fitzgerald, and the legends of jazz and popular song here. This is Joseph Holmes. Before he died, I believe in 1986 from AIDS complications, he was on his way to being one of the most important choreographers and young dancers of the, the American experience. Jack L. Cooper, the first syndicated nation, nationwide radio guy. His show was in Chicago. You can tell. Oh, for those of you who are younger than 25, these are records. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lorraine Hansberry. It is enough for me to say this about her. Nina Simone wrote Young, Gifted, and Black about this playwright. If, if you want a song written about you, Unless, uh, except for I love you, you want it praising your ability and praising your value as a human being. And that's Lorraine Hansberry, the great playwright from the south side of Chicago. Wilbur Campbell, a distant relative of mine, rest in peace, the first prominent African American architect in our nation's history, a, a south sider, not only went to the Illinois Institute of Technology, but he started, studied directly under Mies van der Rohe. Janet Langhart Cohen, she is an activist and a political um, talking head now, but before she did that, she's from, I believe she was from Indianapolis, she came to Chicago because she's a looker and she wanted to get a career in modeling. So she got into modeling in Chicago and before you knew it, she was wearing the bridal gown at the annual fashion show for Marshall Fields. Which I didn't know, but that's like bad and clean up for the Yankees. Great, great lady. On, Sorry? Uh, anchor? She was an anchor. No, she, uh, she was just speaking there. That's why the... No, I'm talking about WGN. Oh, was she there? Thank you. Here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Learn, and pardon my cold hands. I'm sorry. As I get older, my circulation gets worse. Oh, <laughs> Muddy Waters, the definitive voice, many people will say, of Chicago blues, the first wave of Chicago blues. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. I put this picture of Sam Cooke up there because I wanted you to see, first of all, wanted you to remind you how cool this cat was. And he 
wrote his own songs. It was, you know, any fool can stand up and be handsome and darling you, but he wrote his own songs and arranged them, and he is playing a G minor 7 there, so you know he knows what he's doing. Sam Cooke, um, if you have Netflix, there is a new documentary on the murder of Sam Cooke. It is heartbreaking. It is fascinating. But South Said, the largest funeral in the history of, uh, you're welcome, in the history of the Leak Funeral Parlor was Sam Cooke's funeral. Lecu, another South Sider, the most decorated man, the most decorated individual with regard to the Grammy. And, you know, I'd be happy too if I had an armful of Grammy. And, and y'all, y'all, that's for one album. That's from, from Thriller. That's when he produced Thriller, yes. Yeah, he and Michael Jackson, they got a, oh, oh, oh. So, you big dummies. This man's name was John Sanford, originally from St. Louis. He wanted to get to a bigger city to try stand-up. He came to Chicago. Chicago wasn't quite big enough for his talent. So he goes to New York City by day, washing dishes. By night, like so many people back in the 40s and 50s, you went down to the village and you, you worked. Yeah. Open mics and this kind of thing. Since he was originally from St. Louis, but then moved to Chicago. He was working in this kitchen in Manhattan. He had red hair, thus the nickname Red Fox. There was another guy, African-American gentleman, working in that kitchen too, who had red hair. So since John here, look, I, hang on. No, you don't have to be quiet. Just let me, I, I, I know where you're going with this. John Sanford was called Chicago Red. The other guy who was from Lansing, Michigan, was called Detroit Red. In this kitchen, Red Fox and Malcolm X. If they got any work done, it's a miracle. Oh, I wish you love, peace, and soul. Don Cornelius, the former letter carrier on the south side of Chicago, had this dream of a black American bandstand. The first year that Soul Train taped, it taped in the Board of Trade building in downtown Chicago. And then it got bought and he got paid. Ah, oh, yeah. this lady, Barbara Gardner Proctor. Yes. Wonderful woman, she just died two weeks ago. She was an A&R person for VJ Records. There was a time there, if you're standing at Roosevelt Road in Michigan, and you look south, all the way to Cermak, nothing but record companies, radio stations, things like this. And one of the record companies there was VJ Records. She worked as an A&R, an artist and repertoire person, one of the few women in America who was an AR person for VJ Records. So she gets a call in 1963. Excuse me. Yes, I'm calling for Miss Proctor. Yes, I'm calling from London. I have a new band here. Uh, they they have a record deal, and our company EMI owns their affiliate there in America. Capital, but Capital refuses to release their records. Can you help me? Yeah, I'll be right over. She catches the first thing smoking, and she has with her the British rights for an American group called the Four Seasons that is not hit in Britain. She trades the British rights, British release rights of the Four Seasons for the American release rights for this other band. What was that British band? The Beatles. The first American records by the Beatles were produced by VJ. And depending on what you get and what kind of good shape it's in or not, it can be worth thousands of dollars. I found one at a thrift store, a 45, and I thought, oh, I'm retiring. There was a, I took it out of the jacket and there was a huge scratch in it. So I paid a dollar and a half, but it was worth five dollars. So there I go. <laughs> and so when she finally left VJ and she was the first woman in American history to start her own advertising company. I knew you knew what was coming up. Another of the great American novels. This is Richard Wright, Notes to the Native Son and so forth, another Chicago guy. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, for what it's worth, the fact that he put the headquarters of the Nation of Islam on the south side of Chicago automatically made Chicago huge with regard to the African American experience in the second half of the 20th century, leading directly to a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> 
I don't know what's more impressive, Muhammad Ali or all of these buildings from the 1920s. I, I rest in peace. I got the opportunity after he had been recertified and and came out of his suspension. He was in Chicago training at um, Mayor at what was called Mayor Daly's gym at Navy Pier before Navy Pier was uh, renovated and so forth. And being in the same room with this dude was impressive. If you ever meet my mother, she was the one woman who was allowed to go by the velvet rope and talk to him and shake his hand and squeeze his muscle. She has not recovered, and this was, this was some 45 years ago. You say Muhammad Ali, and my mother completely turns red and she faints and everything. I didn't realize he was so big. Who did my, that picture? Sorry? Who did that picture? I don't know who the photographer was. I mean, that's absolutely wonderful. It is great. Oh, excuse me. I just happened to see Thomas Hepker Magnum photo. Just happened. To, I knew that by heart. Incredible. Yes, it's a great picture, and it's so full with so much energy. His name was Milton Olive the Third. He arrived in Chicago with his family during the Great Migration, and he joined the army during Vietnam, the Vietnam War. Our first two wars in the American experience where lots and lots and lots of people of color were used disproportionately to whites. He wanted to go and fight, so he went over to Nam and threw his body on a live hand grenade that was getting ready to kill a bunch of his buddies. He was the first African American in history to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. Say, and there's a park named after him right there at the north side of Navy Pier. Gwendolyn Brooks, there she is, another one of our great definitive writers. The American Experience, Chicago Science. Hey, if you like trash television, and who doesn't, on a Thursday night, if you've watched Grey's Anatomy or Scandal or How to Get Away with Murder, the most popular woman in Hollywood is a girl from the south side, Chandra Rhimes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, my goodness. My man, Andre Brower. Yes, another. This guy is the. He walks into a room. He's the heaviest dude in the room. He's in a comedy now. He's great at comedy. He's in Brooklyn Nine Nine. He's a hoot. I didn't because I. He, ooh, Andre Brower is. Oh, you know, all six foot tall, swaggering in. Look, I'm Detective Bremberton. You know, um, he's great. And like everybody from Chicago, he's great. He's in ten thousand black Georges. 10,000 black men named George. Is that a play or is that a film? It's a movie. It's about the Pullman Porters. Beautiful. Unionizing the Pullman Porters. Thank you very much. See, this is community. And this library has it. I have a copy right now. Patty, would you please, would you come up with a stipend for this lady and this lady here because of what they've contributed? A couple more here. The Brothers Gumbel, Brian and Greg Gumbel from the south, from the north side of Chicago. The rare, rare, rare picture of them together. Two broadcasting legends. The Honorable Jesse Jackson, for what it is worth, whatever you think of him, I really don't care, but <laughs> he's important for two reasons. One, when he became Dr. King's aide during the last few years of Dr. King's career, he was invaluable to Dr. King because he was the youngest guy on Dr. King's staff and he was the only one of Dr. King's people who lived in a northern city. And this is what Dr. King was starting to explore and he needed this voice and, and and, and decades later, 1984, this man ran for president. And I'm like, oh, Jesse's going to get his backside kicked. And then I saw a clip of him talking to a bunch of farmers in Nebraska, and they were digging him. And I thought, wow, this country, it, it slowly changes, but this country has changed. And the candidacy of the right Reverend Jackson, you can draw a line from it to this. And things swing back backwards and forwards. This man and his lovely family, these two women are grown now, two grown women now, it's hard to believe. But it's so important when we, when we look at the black experience in Chicago from Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable to President Obama to more importantly, the people who aren't famous in our own community, everybody in this room, our differences and so forth. If we take advantage of these teachable moments and these moments where, hey, I'm wrong. It's time for me to learn. I've been wrong for 50 years about this. Let me talk to this man. Let me talk to this woman. We can enrich 
ourselves and our experience and I would ask you ladies and gentlemen next summer gas up your car drive around the south side and the west side of Chicago and in spite of the fact that there's some economically challenged situations in homes and so forth you see these beautiful murals all over and moreover you see murals like this all over the city to remind us that this city that we love that I love is just one big quilt mm -hmm. and nobody's going anywhere so get used to it if you've enjoyed yourself this afternoon thank you for oh I passed it up oh, I messed up wait a minute Oh, well, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> I, I had a couple of images that I was going to plug myself. I didn't know what happened. Wait a minute, because I'm not getting out of here without a plug. Oh, you know what it is? I did uh, something on Al Capone the other day. I forgot to put my shameless plugs on there. If you have enjoyed yourselves today, follow me on Facebook. My Facebook page is C, the letter C, Chicago. My website is clarencegoodman.wix.com slash Clarence Goodman that I update every century or so. Um, if you, I, I'm writing a book. If you want to read some excerpts from the book, go to my blog, clarencegoodman.blogspot.com. If you like to listen to stuff on your CD player, I've got spoken word excerpts from my book called Nerd Avenue. I just happened to cleverly have copies of that with me today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, and may your God go with you. Thank you. Thank you. If you share what you just shared with us about contacting you with me, anyone who signed up for the program, I can email you this week. I sure will. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was spectacular. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks to Patty and thanks to Brittany here. Did I jump around enough? <laughs> Alrighty, everybody. Um, spring is just around the corner. You get to St. Valentine's Day, and before you know it, everybody will be drunk in a pub together on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Take good care, everybody. Thanks.